So this paper is already published. You've seen it circulated. Uh, it's work that I didn't do alone. I did it uh, with Gary Sutkin. Uh, Gary is a surgeon, a women's health expert. He's a delightful human being that, uh, whom I met in a really interesting way. So I'll share this story. Uh, for people, you probably all have seen the paper, but there's a short link to it and a QR code. Um, so you're all invited to look it up, uh, read it, and write to me if you uh, you have thoughts. Um, I always appreciate feedback. So. I will start with uh, how this research happened. So the proximal cause is a chance encounter in Glasgow. I was at the uh, Association for Medical Education in Europe conference, and I saw that one of my colleagues from grad school was also at that conference. So he works in Singapore, and we organized to have lunch together. And we're sitting, and he also does observational research, and we were commiserating about how difficult it is to publish observational research in the health sciences. And we both identified this devaluing of data based on observational research as prone to the Hawthorne effect as a big thorn in our back. Um, we were constantly being asked to justify the validity of our data, whether or not we had any claims on truth for what we had observed, and it really felt we really felt that it diminished how well our work was understood. So, um, as we are having this conversation, there's this man who jumps in and said, "Hi, I'm Gary," uh, <laughs> and he says, "I'm also trying to publish observational research, and I also struggle." So we decided to try to pitch a commentary to the editor of a key journal in our field, medical education, about the Hawthorne effect. So a 400-word piece. Uh, so I thought that's what we thought initially. 400 to 1,000 word piece. So I pitch it to the editor and he's like, that's a fantastic idea. Like, why don't you uh, actually submit for a special issue on methods, which is published every year? So we embarked on this journey uh, together. And then Isaac couldn't, uh, my colleague from Stanford, couldn't continue on with us. He was moving to Oxford and starting his PhD there. So he was too busy to keep uh, at this. And Gary and I just started working together. And then the distal cause is really this dissonance between my sociological training and the paradigm I was exposed to during my postdoc, right? So I should also say my historical training. I was trained in undergraduate, uh, my undergrad here at the University of Toronto in history of science. And I was, I think of a lot of things as a historian, as you've seen in the paper. Uh, and then in my sociological training, I had never heard of the Hawthorne effect. And then I come to do my postdoc and I do a lot of methodology. I feel like my postdoc was a, a boot camp in methodology training and it was everywhere, right? And then in the publication process, it was still everywhere. So um, I felt the need to push back and try to reconcile this understanding. As I will discuss later, uh, working with a surgeon on this project has been very interesting. And that's the kind of issues that all of us at CQ often face. So I'll reserve this for later. So the introduction to this paper. So observational methods are increasingly being used in health research, yet a common critique persists and may prevent their full appreciation. That they are prone to the Hawthorne effect, defined as observers' influence on research participants' behavior. And I want to focus on this definition because a causal link is really imputed to be from the researcher onto the participants, right? So as researchers, we are transforming the behavior of our participants, therefore invalidating the quality of our data. This is very concerning, because if observer effects are strong, then observational research merely reports what research participants want us to see, rather than exposes what really goes on when no one is watching. So in our paper, we use three forms of data to argue that our conceptualizations of observer effects are oversimplistic. Then, in light of this evidence, we suggest some fertile avenues for future research that considers research participants' reactivity to the goal of the research rather than observer effects. So we're trying to put the causal link in the other direction, right? That it is not the observer who's, who's causing the effect, it's the people who are reacting to the observer. So let's start with this first piece of evidence, the Hawthorne studies and the Hawthorne effect. 
So the Hawthorne experiments were conducted in Cicero, Illinois, between 1924 and 1933. And for you history buffs, you know that this is overlapping with the Great Depression, right, for four years. They have taken on a mythical power in the social and behavioral sciences because they align with our scientific stories of discovery. There's an aha moment in this story, and people really are drawn to it because of that. Right. So it's the, the, the victory of the scientist over the difficulty of understanding social life and voila. And because it was so early in the history of the social sciences, it stuck. So what is this story? So in very condensed form, the story goes as follows. Scientists, after, a fa after failing to establish a causal link between working conditions and productivity, which they were trying to understand in this factory setting, ultimately discovered that special attention by supervisors led to improved productivity by the workers. It is this special attention that is generally thought to constitute the Hawthorne effect and to have implications on research participants' behavior, right? So we're there, we're, we're paying attention to these people, and therefore they are responding by adapting their behavior. Yet this story misrepresents what actually happened. And I have only like three bullets here, but there's a lot more in the paper. And the initial, so the, the paper is actually 4,000 words. It was initially 8,000 words, and then we had to <laughs> shrink it down, right? So people who are interested in the longer version, I still have it. There's a lot more of the historical narrative in it. So the first thing is two of the initial operators were forcibly removed for insubordination and replaced by much faster operators. So there was a group of five women, five women, and two of them were agitators, right? And then they removed the disruptive women and ah, oh, surprising, productivity increased. But that's not at all what the original investigators report in their data, right? So it's archival research that uncovered all of this. Then second, reanalyses of the Hawthorne studies further undercut, undercut the traditional account. The replacement of these two operators, the Great Depression on the four, last four years of the study, and the quality of the raw material explained about 90% of the variance in productivity. So not all of you will be trained in statistics, but when you can build a model that has 90% explanatory power for human behavior, you've hit it on the head. Like you have, that's the best kind of model you can ever do. Like most social models are about 20%, 25% of the variance, right? So when you explain 90% of the variance with through variables that have nothing to do with the Hawthorne effect, there's like not much room there for uh, extraneous variables. And finally, Levitt and List summarized their reanalysis of the Hawthorne data by noting that perhaps the most important lesson to be learned from the Hawthorne studies is the power of a good story. Right? So this is why the, the, the paper is called Beyond a Good Story, because there's nothing much there, so we're trying to move forward. The second source of data is uh, the case, the contemporary case against the Hawthorne effect, and I'll focus on four points. The first one is that data from the original Hawthorne studies are not compatible with a Hawthorne effect. The second is that the original 1953 conceptions, uh, conception of the Hawthorne effect by French is generally discussed out of context. And when we look at this, context, this contextually, we see a broader methodological concern with experimental findings, not naturalistic observations, but experimental findings. And when I found this, my historical geek was just so excited, <laughs> right? So the critique is from a methodological point of view, and there's a lot of talking, but then the first part, Careful studies of this wiring group showed, mark, showed marked increases in production, which were related only to the spacious, special social position and social treatment they received. And then, thus, it was the artificial social aspect of the experimental conditions set up for measurement which produced the increases in group productivity. So his concern was with how these women had been put in, the in a different room removed from the natural setting of the experiment of the of the factory given all this much more attention and the experiment that was run there invalidated the quality of the data because it was not a natural setting right so he's basically criticizing experimental research and yet we've turned this critique into a critique of naturalistic observation right so i was just like wow i would have written the paper just about that but they wouldn't let me <laughs> 
Third, the three main mechanisms identified by researchers as constitutive of the Hawthorne effect, so these are three main things, special attention, awareness of being in an experiment, and novelty, are not supported by contemporary research. So studies of studies, meta-analyses, and all the like show that there's no there there. They've, there's uh, 30, 40 years of research trying to pin down the Hawthorne effect, and they're unable to, right? So there's that not that 10% variation, not likely the Hawthorne effect. And finally, contemporary uses of the Hawthorne effect are so broad and inconsistent as to make usage of the term meaningless. Kesa and Hobbes indeed found it used as environmental factors, intervening variables, and behavioral ch changes. And that's after coding uh, hundreds of versions of the definition of the Hawthorne effect and finding that it amounts to not much. So in light of these four things, we say, there's no there there, right? The Hawthorne effect is a meaningless term because it has too many definitions. It does not reflect the initial formulation. Um, and what were the other two? <laughs> no, the, the, there's no data, right? So in health research, the Hawthorne effect is generally discussed in context of qualitative research, as I have said, and is an important methodological con consideration. And yet our experimental colleagues have not really had to face to the music, right? How weird. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about strong effects of observation, in what context would you expect to find them? I would, I would say in experimental research. And strangely, uh, when we looked specifically at the health professions education literature, we were unable to locate example of observer effects in published articles, despite how it is accepted, an accepted methodological challenge for observational research. So it's everywhere in textbooks, or like how to do the intro to qualitative research methods, and yet there's no actual empirical um, discussion of what that might look like in practice. And indeed, we found so many questionable uh, instances of questionable behavior that we would think that it's unlikely to be a strong thing if observers doing research in these contexts are able to describe so many problematic behaviors, right? So to try to palliate this gap, we turn to the Hawthorne effect in our own. The Hawthorne effect, we'll do the square quotes from uh, now on, in our own research. And I'll start with uh, one of the two vignettes we discuss in, from Gary's research uh, in surgery and surgical education. So what Gary does is he pays um, research assistants to go and film surgery as it is happening. Right? So the person is a young woman on a platform using a camera, looking directly at people as they're operating. She's very visible. It's not hidden at all. Um, and the first vignette is called, If I Had an Invisibility Cloak. Attending and fellow are operating together intently. Attending would be staff physician, staff surgeon in this case. The observer is directly across from the attending and has a camera focused on her. She looks into the camera, pauses, and asks, are you not allowed to talk to us? The observer, well, I prefer not to, she laughs. I'm just trying to be as inconspicuous as possible. The attending, <laughs> you're not inconspicuous. The observer, if I had an invisibility cloak, I'd be better off. The attending, that's right, you need an invisibility cloak. The attending immediately refocuses on the operative field. Only twice over 115 minutes of filming did any members of the surgical team look at the camera, despite the observer standing within three, three feet of the surgical field. So what do we learn from this? Well, we learn, we think that surgeons are intently focused on the operative field and the ease with which they block out distractors and stimulants suggests that they are not likely to be influenced by another quiet presence. And my current research in the OR suggests this as well. There's often upwards of 10 people in a surgical case. Why would the addition of another person really transform all the social dynamics? Then they are also used to surveillance. Their activities are public and actively watched by many, including students, other healthcare professionals, sales representatives, etc. And there's increasing practice towards including uh, cameras in operating rooms, right, for safety and accountability, especially in the US. Third, interactions between observer and participants were very rare in the data. He found actually only two instances in his whole research project. Right, and you've seen one of the other, the two, and the other was a case of uh, uh, like off-color humor, 
right? And as he as uh, and he also like we have found in the literature found he has found suboptimal or potentially embarrassing behavior which occurred frequently, right? So in some we concluded that observers are unlikely to have a significant impact on surgical te teaching and surgical practice. Uh, and after hours in the field myself in that context, I, I would I would still stand by this general finding. And then we turn to my own research. Again, there are two uh, vignettes in there, but I'll focus on curtains up. Eric, an ICU fellow, and Lauren, an ICU resident, are working together to put a trialysis port on Mr. White, a homeless man with a beard. So a trialysis port is a port through which you can at once do dialysis on the patient and also give them nutrition or antibiotics or, or other uh, intravenous uh, medication. Eric admits that he's totally paranoid about cleaning skin surfaces. People are gross, he says, especially homeless people. Eric, who wants to leave by 6 p.m., tells Lauren, you've got three minutes left, so you should be good. He then looks in my direction and adds, I was going to say something really sarcastic, but I know you're listening. I ask him to ignore me. Lauren shares that another ICU fellow teaches her differently. He says it's not going to be perfect, move on, while you say it's perfect, move on. That's confusing. Eric looks up at me. I get written up for bad behavior all the time. I laugh and he reiterate, reiterates, I'm not joking. When Lauren finds the artery on the monitor, Eric cheers. You find it right away, good job. He then turns towards me. Did you know that? Positive reinforcement. Lauren struggles a bit, poking at Mr. White's skin. Blood squirts as she pushes a wire in and the patient makes a big jerking motion. She apologizes. It was an idiotic move, Eric, to Lauren. It was a learner move, not idiotic, then to me. Did you get this? As I walk out of room six, Pamela, the nurse, tells Russell, the respiratory therapist, that she sent me to watch Eric and Lauren. Does it happen often, I ask? That blatant attitude? No, responds Pamela. It's just confirming that he's a capital D. And Russell concurs. So what did we learn from this? Well, we learned that learners can adapt their behaviors when they're observed. What they enact then is their understanding of the right way to behave. And this is in itself very interesting data. Then relationships with informants are key in ethnographic research and other observational research, I would argue, for two reasons. First, they enable access to specifically problematic situations, like in this case. Like Pamela and I were very close and she would often say like, go tiger, go get them, right? So she would send me in the direction of uh, the capital D's on a semi-regular basis uh, because that was her way of advocating for her profession and uh, she, she trusted me to do justice to what I was seeing, right? And then the second point is that the natives' emic understanding of situations can be tapped to contrast with our own ethic understandings um, as ethnographers, right? So it's, uh, I hate using triangulation because I think it's been overused, but it gives us a, a different source of data uh, against which we can contrast our own perspective. And uh, the intersection of these two things is what is the most interesting, I would say, ethnographic research, right? When the, in the insider perspective clashes with the outsider perspective, we, that's where we find culture. That's where we find socialization. That's why where we find interesting social phenomena. And thus, we summarize that ethnology is a method, eth sorry, ethno ethno ethnology, I don't do ethnology. <laughs> Ethnography is a methodology that builds relationships over time and thus can, used, can use social capital to improve the quality of the data collection through exposure and member checking, uh, which you could also frame as triangulation, although I'm cautious with triangulation. Um, finally, what we're trying to argue for is participant reactivity and not observer effects. So in light of our research, we propose the following change. To move from the language of the Hawthorne effect, which I have, I think, demonstrated quite clearly is not a useful concept, or observer effect, or again, are, I think are misleading, to the use of participant reactivity. We define participant reactivity as an effect that comes from participants' active engagement with the research and its aims, a process that leads to adaptation that aligns with the perceived social, perceived social norms of behavior. 
right? So there's important elements in this definition. First, it's an active engagement from the participant, right? It's not necessarily a pass. It's not a passive process. They're not just uh, mice that were uh, poking. They're actually engaged in this process of construction. The Research and its aims are important. If they, the participants don't know what you're looking for, they can't enact it, right? So um, then there, there's, well, I'll talk more about this. Then um, it's this adaptation that aligns with perceived norms of social behavior, right? And the norms of social behavior are the key interesting thing, I think, for us as social scientists is what do people think these norms are? What are they responding to? What do they see, as Eric saw, as the appropriate way to behave? And in his case, we agree he's a total failure at convincing me that he is <laughs> a good learner, a good teacher, uh, can receive feedback, and, and is caring for his learners, right? But uh, you could think of someone who's more successful and, and defeat, um, deceives you into uh, buying their performance. So this, rec this definition recognizes that the main mechanism for behavioral change lies in participants' cognitive work and is not merely the result of a presence of researchers. And importantly, such an effect should be small since social psychological research shows that one's actions are relatively unaffected by normative information and that this type of information loses its salience over time, right? So here again, ethnography and continuous exposure to the field allows us to... Um, uh, make, make participants forget the, the, the research question and whatever normative aspect there would be within it and then enact their true, uh, the, w their true selves, if we believe in such a thing. Uh, I, like, I shouldn't say that. Enact what they perceive uh, to be the right way of behaving in, in this context. So rigorous reflexive observational research in healthcare is unlikely to be distorted by strong participatory activity for two main reasons. First, the demands of care are often too great for providers to access this normative information and adapt their behavior. In the case of surgery, for example, like there's so much going on, um, so many people involved. It's unlikely that there's extra cognitive space for normative information. And health professionals are almost always observed. Right, there is very little. I mean, there in in tertiary hospitals for sure. There's very little uh, practice that is unobserved or non-social. So I think that again, the presence of the observer will not make a huge difference. So we have some um, advice for observational research that would capitalize on what we have uncovered through this paper, uh, and one would be to. Well, so to minimize participants' reactivity to being studied, we would embed ourselves within uh, the environment and conduct sustained observations. We would cross-check our ethic understanding of situations with the emic view of participants. We would record and evaluate interactions between subjects and researchers, right? Like the case of Eric, it tells us a lot about what are the norms of um, teaching and feedback in this hospital. We could consider limiting our participants' awareness of the specific research question and its normative uh, aspects. And we uh, should pay particular attention to tasks where the right answer, the right behavior is known and easily enacted, right? So an observational study of hand washing uh, will be prone to strong behavioral adaptation because it's a very easy thing to enact. In contrast, feedback is very loosely understood. Right? So if you're not um, giving a lot of uh, information about what kind of feedback you're studying and what specifically it is that you are studying, it's much harder to enact good feedback on a systematic, consistent manner because the mandate is very vague. And then for reviewers and uh, all of us who also have editorial roles, consider whether the participants' behaviors could have been impacted by reactivity to the research and the research question, particularly if they were aware of the research question and could have easily conformed to the researcher's expectations. So if this was a traditional talk, I would say this is the end, thank you very much, and you would applaud, it would be very fine, but this isn't, we're not normative people. Uh, what was that we're watching? Like, we're not, what is normal, right? So since this is a CQ talk, I will start with uh, residual discomfort, then talk about the newfound interest, then extend an invitation and uh, offer a few uh, orienting questions. So the residual discomfort comes partly from this joint authorship business. 
because I will have to admit, and uh, Gary fully knows that, that I was ready to throw the baby with the bathwater, right? I really don't believe that there is much of a there there. Um, and he was not ready to do this, right? For him, like systematically recording these observations and really doing analytic work around the observer effect is really important because he, I think he has a greater commitment to truth than I do, right? I'm much more interested in perceptions and interpretations of social norms and their impact on behavior than on the absoluteness of this is the way people behave. I don't, I don't find these questions as interesting, right? So I think that because we have different understandings of, like ontological understandings, we clash and we have a hybrid paper in this case. I think he went way more critical than he would normally have and that he could have done on his own. And I went more positivistic than I would have if I hadn't been working with him, if I had working, been working with one of us, for, for instance, right? Um, and then I'm really uncomfortable with this double standard that we have across the epistemic divide of experimental work versus observational uh, naturalistic observation, right? Like why is it that it is qualitative researchers that bear the burden of this Hawthorne effect when, as I said, the, we would hypothesize the, the, the Hawthorne effect to be stronger in experimental research, right? Given the constraints, the, given the, the minute attention to every detail, given the recording and the absolute precision of uh, what we're recording, right? It's much easier to uh, place a needle here or there than it is to uh, fake good feedback. Right and yes, we 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 have uh, uh, this extra thing to think of and justify. Um, my newfound interest is on social influence. So um, social influence is basically the recognition that all humans are very social beings and that when we are around other people, we respond to that influence, right? So if, um, I was telling you so this, this morning, if your dean is behind your back as you're typing something, you're going to act very differently than if it's your pal or if it's your colleague, right? So we load these scripts that, uh, that show how much social influence we are under, right? So what I wonder is like, could we have just not written this paper and try to write a paper instead on how we mis have mistakenly collapsed social influence and observer effects, right? Because is it, if the, if the observer was an accreditation body, if the observer was your dean or your department chief, you would adapt your behavior in much greater ways than you would for a lowly researcher whom you've never known, you've never met, who has no lever onto you, cannot enact any coercive mechanisms. So the stakes are really low when you have a researcher come into a space in contrast with a higher power person, right? So could we make an argument that what is really happening there is social influence and not merely research interference? So something for us to discuss. Um, the invitation is, many of you have heard about this already, and I want to put, plug it there. So uh, with my colleagues, Lara Varpio and Chris Watling, we have um, pitched this uh, thing that we call a qualitative space for qualitative research in uh, health professions education really loosely understood. So the short link is there. That's the um, introduction to the the space. Perspective is a very little known research. It used to be a Dutch journal. It's now an open access, you don't pay anything journal that is not predatorial. So it is funded by the Dutch Association of Physicians or something like that. So it's a free to publish free access journal uh, that has an impact factor. It's low, but it's bound to grow because we're doing a lot of work and publishing a lot of really great articles there. And what we have introduced is a place for um, advanced or like medium to advanced qualitative researchers who want to publish their methodological work um, to push the field further. So there's three types of content. So the first is um, if you submit a really cutting edge empirical paper using qualitative research methods that are innovative, we will commission a commentary on it. 
right? So you will get an extra, like a citation and someone who highlights uh, your contribution and gives it more credibility, right? So that's one thing you can do. The second thing is we invite uh, um, scholars who are known for a specific uh, methodology to come and share their expertise on a specific topic. And self-nominations are welcome, right? Like if you are interested in writing up what you're, you're doing, you can come see me. Um, we'll work with you to create something like this. And we do put the, the, the papers through peer review, obviously, but we have like a really great editorial team um, that I think have made the papers that have been published through this mechanism really good. And then finally, we uh, encourage uh, submissions from more junior scholars who are doing the cutting edge work often and are struggling to get it published because it doesn't necessarily fit the mold. So we're really open to these kinds of innovative spaces too. So finally, the few questions. Um, and I've talked about this a bit. Are we confusing participant reactivity with social influence? And what would be an interesting way of investigating this and putting in the work of conceptual uh, elaboration. And then what other methodological truths are we uh, in need of questioning, right? The Hawthorne effect is one of the best known uh, uh, methodological artifacts. <laughs> uh, what else is getting, is a thorn in your back and you'd like to um, explode, explore it? Then third, how do we successfully socialize our students across paradigms, right? Because it is easy for people to, like me to get fully re-socialized into a positivistic way of doing things uh, because that's what gets published, right? It's much easier not to push back and not to stay true to what you have learned than to do the work of writing a full paper on something that uh, doesn't feel right, right? Um, conversation for us. And how do we navigate authorship with colleagues across research paradigms? Because I do think that they're very productive. Like we had, it was one of my best co-authoring uh, experiences. And yet the, the, the final paper is, is not exactly what I want it to be, right? And it's, I think it's okay. I love this paper, it's getting cited. Like people, people like it and I really do think it's a good paper, but it's not exactly what I wanted it to be. Um, and then uh, finally, is there a space somewhere for critical and historical scholarship on methodology? Because I, that's one level of social construction that we haven't really discussed, is that our methods are also socially constructed, right? We, together as a community, come to an agreement on what is the norm, what is the standard, what is good research, right? And by historicizing, by doing the comparative work, by doing these types of things, borrowing from other uh, disciplines and stuff, we can actually deconstruct and reconstruct what is a uh, good methodology, right? So where do we do this? How do we do this? Who do we do this with? These kind of questions. And that would be that. Thank you.